This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, this morning, our speaker is Bo Wang. Bo is one of our first year uh, clinical track fellows. Bo is a native Atlantan, grew up not far from Emory, uh, attended Emory for his undergraduate studies, then Medical College of Georgia for medical school, and then uh, did his residency at uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, and he is going to talk to us today, as you can see on screen, about the left atrial appendage. Take it away, Bo. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, yes, we will be discussing the left atrial appendage uh, today, in particular, in the context of uh, left atrial appendage stunning. So for our case presentation here, outline, we'll start with a case and then talk about left atrial appendage development in anatomy, imaging evaluation, with TEE and CT, uh, discuss the clinical significance of uh, spontaneous echo contrast and left atrial appendage sludge in regards to the risk of left atrial appendage thrombi formation, uh, some proposed mechanisms and clinical implications of left atrial appendage stunning, and a quick note on future direction. So our case starts with a 61-year-old male uh, admitted for left upper extremity AV fistula bleed, now status post vascular and, uh, angioplasty. The primary team noted on telemetry that since admission, the patient has been persistently tachycardic in the 100s with very, very minimal heart rate variation. And EP was consulted regarding further evaluation. And looking at his chart of note, he was previously diagnosed with atrial fibrillation just a few months ago when he presented with chest pain. They initially started him on amiodarone and the metoprolol in the amiodarone was discontinued due to uptrending LTs. However, he was able to tolerate the beta blocker and spontaneously converted to normal sinus rhythm prior to discharge. Uh, past medical history-wise, uh, paroxysmal AFib, non ischemic cardiomyopathy, EF is severely decreased 20-25% with some moderate left atrial dilation as well. Of course, he's ESRD and type 2 diabetes. Uh, pretty unremarkable social history, past surgical history, uh, as ESRD and kidney failure related uh, surgeries, uh, family history of hypertension. And medication wise, he's on amlodipine, eloquiz, aspirin, metropolis, sevelomir, and insulin. So, uh, vitals wise, pretty unremarkable aside from the tachycardia, of course. Uh, here it's noted to be 114. On exam, uh, pretty unremarkable aside from the left upper extremity fistula, he's overall pretty euvolemic. Normal labs, uh, potassium of 4.4, view and cranium, of course, elevated. Of course, he's a bit anemic with hemoglobin 9.4, uh, thrombocytopenic platelets 65. So from our initial evaluation of this patient, we get a picture that he has multiple comorbidities that puts him at high risk for thrombus formation uh, in the setting of cardioversion, such as severely decreased uh, EF, moderately enlarged left atrium, and also platelet dysfunction. Um, so this, this is presenting EKG, uh, significant for typical flutter, uh, rates in the 100s uh, with left anterior fascicular block. Uh, due to his decreased left ventricular ejection fraction, EP recommended inpatient attempt at normal sinus rhythm, cardioversion after ruling out left atrial appendage rhombus. So of course, uh, these uh, consults came in on a Friday. So uh, in the Spirit of not uh, wasting time, we decided to recommend a cardiac CT for left atrial appendage evaluation over the weekend in hopes of avoiding TEE the following Monday. However, uh, come Monday, the CT was not completed. Uh, he underwent TEE prior to cardioversion. So on the left here, uh, you can see we have a two chamber view. It shows significant grade four spontaneous echo contrast in the left atrium and left atrial appendage. This, in fact, so severe that you can see evidence of mitral regurgitation, even without the use of Doppler. And the left atrium itself is moderately dilated with decreased left uh, atrial appendage flow velocity, but no evidence of thrombus. Um, of course, this is a singular view here at 71 degrees, but it is representative of the other views obtained during this TEE. And on the right-hand panel here, you see decreased late diastolic emptying velocity, which is a marker of left atrial appendage contractility. So overall, uh, 
if you look at the other images as TEE, we get a picture that this is a mildly dilated LV, a severe global hypokinesis, and severely reduced systolic function uh, with estimated ejection fashion about 20, 25%. Um, given that there was no evidence of left atrial appendage thrombus, the patient had successful external transferatic cardioversion, normal sinus rhythm with one shock at 200 joules. And unfortunately, the order for the cardiac CT that was ordered on Friday was not canceled, and he was scanned about two hours after the cardioversion. And so here uh, we had the cardiac CT in the arterial phase. And on the left hand side, the axial arterial phase image. This shows layering contrast in left atrial appendage. So it is important to note that because CT contrast is denser than blood, this layer can actually reflect incomplete mixing artifact in a hypokinetic left atrial appendage. And to truly rule out a clot or a true thrombus, uh, delay phase should be performed. And then on the right, let it play for a second. It's so a reformatted two-chamber view. Um, this is reformatted to be about the same view as we got in the TEE. Uh, you can see again the left atrial appendage containing layering contrast. Uh, you can see it's sharp and horizontal demarcation and the bright contrast in the filling defect. So we get an idea there may be something there at this point, given the arterial face CT can completely rule out that is an artifact. Next slide here, uh, these are cardiac CT delayed phase images. This shows a persistent filling defect in the left atrial appendage, and this is compatible with a thrombus measuring about 3.1 centimeters in length. Uh, this is actually a smaller filling defect than the initial uh, image seen on the arterial phases. And on the right, again, reformatted, be similar to the TEE image we had earlier, <clears throat> note the rounded borders of the thrombus on the reformatted two-chamber view, as opposed to previously demarcated horizontal uh, borders. So clinical course, given the left atrial appendage thrombus formation while in eloquist, the patient was transitioned from eloquist to warfarin for three months repeat TEE. And overall, I thought this is a very interesting case because there are very few case reports in the literature of a, this exact scenario where you have a left atrial appendage thrombus formation while on a DOAC after cardioversion for AFib or atrial flutter uh, because imaging is not often obtained after cardioversion. Therefore, of course, the management of this phenomenon varies widely. Uh, now, transitioning into discussion about the left atrial appendage, uh, it's a major source of thromboembolism in patients with AFib and atrial flutter. Uh, it itself is a contractile reservoir and decompression chamber. It acts as a suction during ventricular systole and as a conduit during diastole. It is physiologically active. It produces 30% of atrial nephrotic peptide uh, when stretched. And factors that we know are associated with left atrial appendage thrombus formation include persistent or longstanding atrial fibrillation. Uh, low emptying velocities, enlarged left atrial appendage and left atrial size, and reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. And overall, in the literature, uh, the left atrial appendage accounts for about 91% of thrombus sources in non valvular AFib, and 15 to 38% in non AFib patients with cardiomyopathy and stroke. And our patient in this presentation has several of these risk factors, including low emptying velocities enlarged left atrium and reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. So he was definitely high risk going into this cardioversion. A quick note on left atrial appendage development is formed in the fourth week of embryonic development as a remnant of the embryonic left atrium. The, left of the, left, the rest of the left atrium develops as an algorithm of the pulmonary veins. And this results in muscular ridges in the left atrial appendage that we know as pectinate muscles that is as compared to the smooth walled left atrium, which is uh, morphologically different. And in terms of anatomy, typically located between the anterior and lateral walls of the left atrium, left atrial appendage orifice is separated from the left side of pulmonary veins by the ridge, uh, the ligament of Marshall. 
and the pectinate muscles, as we all know, may be mistaken for dawn by or intra atrial masses. And one note, uh, there are many different shapes described for the left atrial appendage. Uh, this is something I didn't know before starting uh, research on this presentation. There's no agreement in the literature on the most common left atrial appendage morphologies. And there are multiple other morphologies described other than what is listed here. Uh, these are the four most commonly accepted anatomical variants consisting of, from the left to right, uh, a cactus, a chicken wing, a windsock, and a cauliflower. So you can see the corresponding CT images and the, uh, and the uh, drawn images on the bottom. Um, the, the importance of this is that recognizing these general morphologic variations is helpful in planning interventions. For instance, uh, the second variant, the chicken wing morphology, with his several sharp bends and an extremely superior left atrial appendage orientation. This is deemed unsuitable for some epicardial closure devices. And after left atrial appendage occlusion, there is a residual risk of pits in the aura diverticula, which are petite structures located around the proximal ostium that cannot be completely occluded by the device's uh, deployment. So uh, depending on which shape uh, the left atrial appendage is in certain patients, it may exclude from certain occlusion devices. And here, uh, this is just for fun. This is a 3D reconstruction of our patient's left atrial appendage. As you can see, um, you can see multiple uh, lobes and ridges uh, that you can imagine would predispose a patient to clot formation. So in addition, Anatomical characteristics of the left atrial appendage may predispose patients to a high risk of metabolic events, uh, as we talked about previously. Uh, this particular study here evaluates anatomical characteristics of the left atrium and the left atrial appendage in relation to the risk of stroke in patients with and without atrial fibrillation. So here, um, the study population consists of 1,813 patients, mean age about 60, 42% uh, female who underwent CT prior to either a transcatheter atrial fibrillation or a clinically indicated for suspected coronary artery disease. So in this study, half the patients had AFib uh, and half the patients did not have known AFib. And for method, they used CT data for volumetric and morphologic evaluation of left atrial appendage. And uh, here, uh, the morphology was classified by three different readers. And the four that they chose were the chicken wing, the swan, the cauliflower, and the windsock. And just like we discussed previously, the study introduces a different morphologic shape called the swan, which appears similar to the chicken wing morphology, but with, with an exaggerated bend at the neck. And in the study, they noted they did not include a cactus morphology because the authors deemed it too similar to the cauliflower morphology. So here, the top figure shows that a cauliflower was the most common morphology. It's important to note uh, that AFib was not associated with any specific morphology. Um, and here on the bottom, uh, you see that the swan morphology was independently associated with prior stroke uh, TIA in the overall study population, an odds ratio of 3.4, and in patients with uh, and without known AFib. And they hypothesized in their discussion that the swan left atrial appendage morphology, due to its curved structure, is associated with a lower flow velocity compared to other morphologies uh, that they studied. And as a consequence, uh, swan left atrial appendage morphology may be prone to stasis of blood, uh, leading to thrombus formation in the occurrence of stroke or TIA. And in terms of evaluation of the left atrial appendage, as we all know, TEE is the gold standard. Uh, it's highly sensitive and highly specific for thrombus evaluation. And a complete left atrial appendage evaluation should include uh, looking at the surrounding structures, assessment of the uh, appendage morphology, its contraction and flow velocities. And uh, as we know, this is best visualizing a mid esophageal two chamber view and mid esophageal aortic valve short axis view. And given this complex anatomy, 
is essentially the image from multiple planes to sufficiently exclude rhombus. So for these images here, you can see that uh, these images show the left atrial appendage in two orthogonal planes, A and B. Uh, the multi-load con uh, configuration of the appendage is not apparent in A, as well as seeing in B, you can see with the red arrows. And in this particular picture, you can see dense spontaneous echo contrast in the left atrium and the left atrial appendage. And for evaluation, the mechanical function is based on pulse wave Doppler of the average peak left atrial appendage emptying velocities. Normal uh, is greater than 0 0.4 meters per second. And it's typically measured at a point of the highest outward flow signal. And left atrial appendage dysfunction is defined as when the peak left atrial appendage emptying velocity is less than 0 0.4 meters per second. And here are the four ways of the pulse wave Doppler evaluation. Um, so starting off, we have the early diastolic emptying velocity. It's a low velocity output signal seen immediately after mitral inflow E wave during the early part of ventricular diastole. The proposed mechanism for this, the fall in the left atrial pressure on opening of the mitral valve in the external compression, the left atrial appendage due to distension of the left ventricle. And a uh, late diastolic emptying velocity is the second, uh, is the most important wave during a sinus rhythm and occurs immediately after the P wave on EKG. Uh, this is believed to be a resulting from active left atrial appendage contraction. And this thus a marker of left atrial appendage contractile function. And it correlates with its ejection fraction, left atrial size and pressure. It's a significant predictor of thrombotic risk. Uh, following that is the left atrial appendage filling velocity, the negative wave that occurs immediately following the left atrial appendage contraction. This is a combined effect of the left atrial appendage relaxation and elastic recoil. It averages about 40 to 50 centimeters per second, and it correlates pretty well with the left atrial appendage contraction and velocity wave. And lastly, we have systolic reflection waves. These are low velocity, multiple alternate inflow outflow waves on the more prominent filling wave described earlier, uh, usually seeing patients with a slow heart rate. And in here, uh, this is, I think it's a very important point, is that the flow pattern and amplitude during atrial fibrillation quite variable, as we know. And it's typically accepted that irrespective of what is measured, the values need to be average over five to 10 cardiac cycles. I think this is a general principle that applies not just to TEE, but also to TTE evaluations as well. Um, this is the AFib-3 trial. This was conducted in 1999 to evaluate the hypothesis that reduced peak emptying velocity was associated with spontaneous echo contrast and thrombus in the left atrial appendage with clinical embolic events. So for this particular study, they took 721 patients with non fabular AFib entering the stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation study. Uh, they took into account patient features, PEE findings, and subsequent cardioembolic events, and correlated that with peak MT flow velocity by multivariate analysis. So here we see the first image that shows that patients with AFib during PEE display lower peak MT flow velocity than those with intermittent AFib in sinus rhythm during PEE. Difference about 33 centimeters per second versus 61 res respectively. This is statistically significant. And the second and third images showed that peak emptying flow velocity less than 20 centimeters per second was associated with dense spontaneous echo contrast, the subsequent cardioembolic events. And it seems likely that reduced flow velocity is a precursor to spontaneous echo contrast, and that dense spontaneous echo contrast is reflective of a local thrombogenic potential. And just a note on spontaneous echo contrast, it's a dynamic smoke-like echo within the left atrial appendage or left atrial cavity uh, from an aggregation of red blood cells and fibrinogen. Uh, it's associated with decreased left atrial appendage emptying velocity, left atrial enlargement, heart failure, um, atrial arrhythmias, and also mitral stenosis. 
This is associated with clinically higher incidence of thrombus formation and thromboembolic events. And there are uh, grading systems for the severity of your spontaneous echo contrast. This was proposed in 1995 by Atkins et al. It's a semi-quantitative method of grading spontaneous echo contrast. Your risk stratified patients were at high risk of embolic events. So as we can see here, uh, grade to zero is a no spontaneous echo contrast. Uh, grade one is very mild and minimal, but located only in the left atrial appendage or sparsely distributed in, in the main cavity of the left atrium. And then as we move up to two, three, and four, uh, there's more density and more swirling pattern. And also uh, it encompasses the majority of the left atrial, uh, the left atrium in itself. <clears throat> And here are the corresponding images of spontaneous echo contrast grades. For grade one, this is a transesophageal echo image uh, where you can see some uh, density and swirling in the left atrial appendage itself, but it's, there's minimal pigeonicity. But with grade four, the swirling pattern is pretty dense. And it's pretty evident in the left atrial, the left atrium itself, beyond the left atrial appendage. Uh, continuing on, there's a entity called left atrial appendage sludge. It itself is, has been defined in the literature as an intracavitary echo density with viscous gelatinous qualities, but without a discrete cardiac mass. Um, it is visually more hyper than spontaneous echo contrast. And the key is it has this layering that you see in the second image uh, with the red arrows. It has been uh, proposed in the literature that slow dynamic nature of the sludge they represent congealing blood, which is a plausible state of higher thromboembolic risk than fibrin stabilized thrombus. And studies have shown that higher thromboembolic risk with sludge um, as compared to spontaneous echo contrast. So I like to think of it as an intermediary between spontaneous echo contrast and actual thrombus. This uh, gives you a pretty clear idea that this patient's at very high risk of thrombus formation if you cardiover. And per the 2019 AHA, CC, HRS, AFib, and atrial flutter guidelines, it is currently a class 2A recommendation for patients of AFib or atrial flutter of 48 hour duration or longer, or of unknown duration who have not been on impact regulation for preceding three weeks to perform a PEE before cardioversion and to pursue a cardioversion if there's no left atrial or left atrial appendage thrombus identified. What's important to note, I think, in this situation is that. Uh, the guidelines do not take into account the presence of spontaneous echo contrast or sludge or other factors uh, such as decreased left ventricular ejection fraction, uh, left atrial appendage size, or flow velocities. I think um, this can be chalked up to uh, you know not a lot of uh, material literature regarding these actual risks and um, how they are uh, related clinically. And we'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. Um, and uh, getting to the uh, discussion about left atrial and left atrial appendage stunning, this is currently defined as a transient mechanical dysfunction of the left atrium and left atrial appendage. Uh, this stunning has been described with all modes of cardioversion from atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter to normal sinus rhythm. And digging into the literature, there's evidence that this happens with transthoracic electrical like external cardioversions, low energy internal cardioversions, uh, pharmacological, spontaneous, and also occurs of overdrive pacing and RF ablation as well. So we'll see in the next few slides. So in terms of the assessment of uh, the uh, stunning itself, there's really no uniform criteria, um, but there are some general markers that we use uh, we look at decreased left atrial appendage flow velocities and emptying fraction, uh, decreased transmitral inflow velocity in the A wave, and of course, the appearance of worsening spontaneous echo contrast. So this is a study uh, by Manny et al. It showed that the mitral A wave velocity and percent atrial contribution to the total LU filling immediately post-transthoracic external cardioversion electrical was significantly lower 
and out of control subjects and did not approach normal until at least a week after cardioversion. Um, and this is a note on internal electric cardioversion. So Omron et al. We performed a serial TE study in 20 patients with AFib, duration of about 78 days, plus minus 89. We underwent internal atrial cardioversion with about uh, energy 7.9 joules. And as you can see here, the data reflects what we saw previously. It shows decreased mitral A wave velocity and percent atrial contribution. The total LV filling, even with internal electric cardioversion, which uh, physiologically makes sense and correlates with our previous study data. And uh, this presentation so far has uh, focused a lot on atrial fibrillation, even though our patient had atrial flutter. So in regards to the difference between AFib and atrial flutter, uh, Grimm et al. study, they demonstrate that, that patients with atrial flutter exhibit a higher precardioversion peak left atrial finished blood flow velocities and those of atrial fibrillation, as you can see in the left hand side. And there were fewer atrial flutter patients who demonstrated new or worsening spontaneous echo contrast on cardioversion. As, as you can see on the right hand side, half the patients with AFib had increased spontaneous echo contrast versus only about 21% in patients with atrial flutter. So overall, uh, based on this study, um, the atrial flutter group showed better left atrial finish function after cardioversion. Um, and here um, is a study looking at the amount of joules given during cardioversion, if that matters, for the degree of uh, left atrial and left atrial finish setting. Um, I want to apologize in advance for the 1996 quality of, the, of these echo images. Uh, these are from the original paper itself. Um, Falco and et al. They measure left atrial finish emptying velocities after each incremental direct current electrical shocks um, at 50, 100, 200, and 360 joules until successful transthoracic electrical cardioversion for AFib. What's interesting to note in this particular study that the peak left atrial finish emptying velocities decreased significantly after successful electrical cardioversion but not after unsuccessful attempts of electrical cardioversion. So this gives us an idea that left atrial finish stunning was not attributed to the amount of joules given during cardioversion itself, but rather the mechanical properties of cardioversion. And similarly, uh, Sparks et al. conducted radio frequency ablation of patients with chronic and paroxysmal atrial flutter. He demonstrated that there is left atrial stunning with radio frequency ablation of chronic atrial flutter, but not in patients with paroxysmal atrial flutter who are in normal sinus rhythm at the time of ablation. So as you can see in the top image, here's the patients with paroxysmal atrial flutter who were, at, who were in normal sinus rhythm at the time of RFA. Uh, they have a higher baseline left atrial finish velocity, and there's really no difference between pre and post ablation in these patients. However, on the bottom you see here, uh, patients with chronic atrial flutter, uh, they have a lower baseline mitral inflow A wave velocity, um, and it doesn't recover until at least a few weeks after the RFA itself. And so how do we determine the severity of atrial stunning? Um, we know that it's affected by the duration of the preceding AFib or atrial flutter, the left atrial size, and the presence of underlying structural heart disease. However, um, it is unclear as to what the exact mechanisms are. However, some have been proposed. Um, it is suggested that atrial stunning results from changes in atrial myocardium that take place during the pre period of preceding atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Uh, the proposed mechanisms of development of atrial stunning include tachycardia mediated atrial cardiomyopathy, uh, cytosolic calcium overload, and atrial hibernation, which we'll talk about in the next few slides.
Um, in terms of the tachycardia mediated atrial cardiomyopathy, this is the first of three proposed mechanisms. And it's the reversal of atrial stunning and the relationship between the chronicity of atrial fibrillation and the severity of left atrial stunning that favors the hypothesis that this may be a tachycardia induced atrial cardiomyopathy um, that causes transient atrial mechanical dysfunction manifesting at convergent sinus rhythm. Um, so the gradual return of atrial mechanical function to normal levels after conversion to sinus rhythm also supports this hypothesis uh, that this may be a form of tachycardia mediated atrial uh, cardiomyopathy, which translates into atrial mechanical dysfunction after conversion to sinus rhythm. So just like we see in the left ventricle, it is plausible that this phenomenon also occurs in the left atrium as well. And the second proposed mechanism is cytosolic calcium overload. So in this particular circumstance, they suspect that acute left atrial contractile dysfunction may be related to the cytosolic calcium overload resulting from abnormal calcium fluxes and sarcomeres in the course of frequent and irregular depolarization of atrial myocytes during atrial fibrillation. Um, they suspect that a chronically calcium overload state may thus lead to desensitization or downregulation of calcium receptors in the atria. Um, however, following rest restoration of sinus rhythm, the calcium overload state is eliminated, and this actually results in a state of relative calcium deficiency because of calcium receptor downregulation. And the following transient decrease in mechanical function is expected to normalize as calcium receptors return to their baseline state. And the last proposed mechanism for left atrial appendage stunning is atrial hibernation. So chronic AFib may result in various structural changes in atrial myocardium resulting in de-differentiation de -differentiation of cells, such as depletion of the sarcomere, accumulation of glycogen, changes in myocardial, mitochondrial shape and size, fragmentation of sarcoplastic reticulum, and aspersion of nuclear chromatin. So these are changes that will happen over a longer period of time. Uh, and these are similar to changes seen in the ventricular myocytes during states of chronic hibernation, suggesting that this may be a possible cause of atrial stunning. And it can be obtained, uh, attained during sustained atrial fibrillation. So in conclusion, um, the incidence of atrial stunning after conversion of atrial fib or atrial flutter ranges from 38 to 80 percent and has been recorded across all forms of conversion. This is associated with increased incidence of post cardioversion thrombus formation in the left atrial appendage. And the degree of atrial stunning is highest immediately post cardioversion and progressively improves over hours to weeks. Uh, there's been studies in the literature that said that uh, the left atrial appendage and left atrial function contractility returns in the vast majority of patients within a week, but there are some that take three weeks or longer. And then, as we discussed, the exact mechanism underlying the development of atrial stunning after conversion of atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter to sinus rhythm is not clear. It may be due to a combination of three etiologies briefly described, uh, such as tachycardia mediated atrial cardiomyopathy, uh, cytosolic calcium overload, and atrial hibernation. And I think the bottom line is uh, there's not a lot of data uh, and uh, studies in literature regarding this phenomenon. And for us, uh, understanding the true mechanism of left atrial and left atrial finger stunning will aid in better risk stratification and guidelines for anticoagulation prior to and following cardioversion. Um, if we know how the stunning phenomenon occurs, we can uh, better risk stratify these patients and also have better pre and post cardioversion uh, treatments aside from just anticoagulation. And I just wanna emphasize that for our particular patient here, he had multiple comorbidities that predisposed him to thrombus formation after cardioversion. And we really need to uh, be cognizant of which patients are at increased thrombotic risk uh, after cardioversion and be more selective about patients. Uh, aside from just a black or white, is there thrombus or not?
And I just want to give a quick thanks to Dr. Lloyd Westerman and Dr. Shaw at Clifton EP, whose discussion on this case inspired this presentation. Um, I'm going to give special thanks to Dr. Fink for his valuable feedback on this presentation as well. Here are my citations. All right. Thank you, Bo. Very nice review of the topic and uh, sort of a bit of a frightening case for those of us that do T cardioversions. Um, you know, I've always uh, sort of said that that the T is not great for actual visualization, sort of surprising a lot in a lot of patients of the left atrial appendage. It's, it's a better assessment of the physiology of the appendage, you know, i.e. the velocities and the presence or absence of smoke, et cetera. But, you know, as, as, as this case exemplifies, there are frequently little nooks and crannies that are often very difficult, if not impossible to see um, with uh, TE. And that, you know, a CT is actually a superior, much superior way of actually visualizing all those nooks and crannies. So I guess, I don't, I don't know what my question is necessarily other than maybe we just need to sort of rethink a little bit about how we assess left atrial appendages and when patients we go straight to the CT potentially or have a lower threshold potentially for using a CT in those where maybe the physiology isn't great and or the visualization isn't great on TE. Thoughts from Bo? Yeah, I think... Uh... In this uh, area, I think cardiac CT um, can also give a better view of the, of the left atrial appendage, particularly in these patients with these very uh, uh, complex left atrial appendage morphologies. So, if we discussed, you know, with these sharp angles and these multi lobes, it may be better visualized on CT versus TEE, but the TE does give a better physiologic evaluation of these uh, appendages. Uh, sorry to chime in. Oh, <laughs> sorry, just because I did the TE and we um, actually uh, what uh, Dr. Joe helped us to do is to exactly match up the CT picture with the TE picture. We had a very good visualization of the appendage. It wasn't like suboptimal in any way. It was completely clear before the cardioversion, and it was not after. Like we could match up the CT picture with the TE picture. 100 percent like at angles different angles and everything and it was just like like night and day uh, stan sherman i i, I was uh, it just bothers me that we stumbled upon the you know thrombus uh because there was a ct after the cardioversions and i wonder how many thrombi we don't see after cardioversion and i just wonder about the change to uh, Coumadin, which, you know, takes some time and intermittent. And I just wonder if it's, if what we don't know is maybe just fine. In other words, when we keep people on Eliquis, uh, maybe with time over a few weeks, the thrombi do go away without having uh, embolic events. Has any events been looked at, studied, or any guidelines about looking for thrombi post cardioversion? Yeah, and looking in the literature, um, there's very few case reports of this actual phenomenon. And in terms of imaging post cardioversion for thrombi, uh, it's largely isolated to these uh, uh, studies with uh, not too many, with not many patients uh, in these small scale studies. I think part of it is the anxiety as a clinician knowing that this patient had a thrombus uh, formation on Eliquis and uh, lack of guidance in terms of guidelines and how to best move forward. Uh, given the lack of data in the space, um, I think it's hard to say which decision is truly best. Like, should we keep them on the DOAC and assume it's gonna go away in the next few weeks as the uh, stunning results and the contractility resumes, or should we switch to different uh, uh, anticoagulant altogether just to make sure that he's not having some uh, resistance to this particular DOAC. So no real data out there? Yes, sir. Gotcha. 
Interesting case. Well done. Bo, this is Andy Smith. I thought that was a great talk. Um, in the beginning, when you mentioned that the patient had a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, and you mentioned the patient had end-stage renal disease, um, the thing that came immediately to my mind was how dilated was the left ventricle. And it, you mentioned that it was only mildly dilated. And um, it's, um, it's well known that end-stage renal disease can actually cause a decrease and sometimes a dramatic decrease in ejection fraction. Uh, what people don't often know is that that often can be reversed with kidney transplantation. Um, so end-stage renal disease can cause a myocardial depressant effect for reasons that aren't, that aren't known. Um, also, when we think about uh, HLA arrhythmias and reduced ejection fraction, um, in the tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathies, uh, often the ventricle is not markedly dilated. Uh, so just a word to people to think about the size of the left ventricle, how dilated is it? If it's not very dilated in the ejection fractions, we're now think about um, what the uh, underlying etiology might be. Um, we see cases of uh, cardiac amyloidosis that aren't thought of where patients are labeled as having non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And so just, just think a little bit about when that ventricle is not real dilated, what's actually going on in that, in that patient. Yeah, but that's a good point. And this patient uh, was definitely predisposed to be at higher risk for thrombus formation, given all of his comorbidities, particularly the ESRD. Yeah, I mean, you could almost develop a risk scoring system for left atrial appendage thrombus, you know, that we're even going into the TE. I have a, you know, uh, it, you know, these folks with LV dysfunction, obviously if they have mitral valve disease, particularly rheumatic mitral valve disease, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, I will say the thing, generally we tend to see a little bit less thrombus formation in, in true flutter if they have isolated flutter. Uh, and also, you know, the, sort of the thought, and there's probably no data to support this, you know, with end-stage renal disease patients and they're sort of coagulopathic, you know, what, is their risk the same? And obviously in this, this case demonstrates that it is, um, or at least in this one case it is. But yeah, you know, like I said, I, you could almost, seems like there could be a, a risk score just based on clinical characteristics, EF, et cetera, um, that would predict left atrial appendage thrombus and probably wouldn't be too much worse than TE itself in terms of predicting, um, you know, not to, discount the importance of T as an echocardiographer, but, but, you know, it seems like a lot of times you can predict these, these thrombi even before you look. This is, this is Mon, uh, very nice talk. So uh, Robbie, to your point, there was a, there was a study about five years ago now, I think it was an American Journal of Cardiology, where they compared stroke risk based on, um, based on Chad's score, I don't think it was Chad's vascular, I think it was Chad's score in people with and without AFib. And they found that the risk was comparable, whether you had AFib or not. And so, uh, and, and there was a subsequent study that I'm blanking on the reference right now that confirmed that with Chad's VASC. Um, and so, you know, a, a lot of patients, a lot of patients don't have AFib when they have stroke most patients don't have left atrial clots when they have stroke, even when they have AFib. So I think AFib, left atrial appendage clot, is only one piece of a much larger puzzle when it comes to risk of stroke. The other thing when we talk about stroke, you know, if you talk to a neurologist, there are different types of stroke. It's not all, they're not all created the same, whether it's even different types of thromboembolic stroke. Um, uh, uh, are, uh, you know, graded differently in terms of what, what is the potential underlying cause. Um, but, uh, but that was a really nice, really nice talk. And, uh, um, and thank you. This is, this is Neil. I, I'll, uh, Mon stole my comment. Um, yeah, I think, I think that paper was in Jack. Um, but it's a really nice paper and, and just a, a minor, 
minor, at least as I remember it, it I don't think it's that AFib is immaterial, but that the Chad's two vascular independently independent of AFib is a substantial predictor of stroke. So in other words, I don't, I don't know that I think AFib is additive, but people with high Chad's two vas have high stroke risks, um, even if they don't have AFib. The the other Correct. the other piece, the other piece that I was gonna say that I think is that that I always um think about a lot and Bo your your talk highlighted this at a couple of different spots is that the mechanism of cardioversion doesn't really matter especially that spontaneous cardioversion probably carries very similar risks as ones that we induce on patients and I think we don't um like especially non-cardiologists but sometimes uh we as well sometimes fail to appreciate that we you know we, we tend to I always talk with residents and fellows sometimes we jump for joy when someone spontaneously cardioverts and we don't tend to take the anticoagulation nearly as seriously um, as if we've done it to them with either a drug or a shock. But if they've been in, to me, some of the data that you presented certainly suggests that they've been in atrial fibrillation for some time. Um, you know, this should be a moment where we take really seriously the the the, the need to anticoagulate them, certainly in the period um, after their after they've been in atrial fibrillation. I feel like that we, we often don't treat those similarly. Um, and, uh, and I think it's important that we recognize the similarities in those circumstances. Yeah, that was definitely a very surprising finding for me uh, in uh, preparing this presentation. And exactly like you said, it's, uh, there's a different mindset when it comes to internal versus spontaneous cardioversion or conversions patients. Uh, for us as clinicians. Neil, would you have switched the anticoagulants? Um, I mean, I've I've done that in cases where for one reason or another, we've needed to image someone and they have a clot. I've seen it, we've certainly done it in cases of LV thrombus. Um, and we've done it and I have done it in, 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 in this case. I don't know that I feel like we have strong data for that, right? I mean, but but yeah. but yeah, I mean, if one, I think just like we do with patients who have, I mean, I think we, we're reasoning from other situations, right? So in the context of LV thrombus, we have better data with, you know, with, with, with warfarin. If you look at patients who are refractory, um, you know, patients with PE who have been refractory with a DOAC, we tend to escalate anticoagulation, whether that's with warfarin or with an oxaparin. I mean, there are other circumstances where we ratchet, we think we're ratcheting up anticoagulation. So I think we, we kind of reason by extension from those circumstances. Yeah, I, I think it's just right for a study because it, it you know, it's only about 70% of people on Coumadin are really anticoagulated. Yeah. And, uh, I think, I think we maybe need to get a study and rethink all this because I think with time, you know, knowing that, that you're always anticoagulated on the eloquus, you know, we, we may be doing the wrong thing. Yeah. I think it's hard to, you know, the, the other challenge is that the, the population you really care about is a population that's failed. They're hard to identify. So there wouldn't be that many. And then, you know, your, your, your point is a good one that, that obviously you have an adherence complication with Coumadin and, um, and, and, you know, there, there's a sort of perfect is the enemy of the good phenomenon with Coumadin that we all certainly are aware of. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, for tuning in. Thank you, Bo. And um, we'll see everybody. we got two more of these, I think, before the, the year ends. So we'll see everybody next Friday. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.